All right, let's get started. Welcome, everybody. Good morning, and um, welcome to the Library Faculty Connect Day. And hi, people on Zoom. We have a camera back there, so if you want to say hi to our Zoom participant, hello, and <laughs> a very passionate audience here. So my name is Maggie Wan. I am an um, information services librarian here, and I'm also the liaison librarian to the School of Business. And today we are very happy to have everyone here to meet up and share ideas to get inspirations maybe for our future collaboration and partnerships. And today uh, we will have uh, five honorable guest speakers to share with us their uh, experience using the library resources and services. And uh, in between, we will have librarians uh, sharing some updates in different areas of services. So we uh, these sections will be very short. So to keep you entertained, and if you want to learn more later on about uh, the project they have shared, feel free to approach them. And to my right hand side and to your left, we have a coffee and drink sections. And don't forget to check out our newly acquired ebook kiosk, our high read kiosk, and also the very popular and famous short story dispenser, the only one in Hong Kong. And uh, recently, we added comic strip contents to the short story dispenser. So feel free to check it out. And without further ado, um, I will pass the mic to our university librarian, Mr. Chris Chan, to give us a warm opening speech. Well, thank you so much, Maggie. I don't know how warm uh, my speech will be. I'll turn the temperature up. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome indeed to Library Faculty Connect Day 2023. And as uh, Maggie alluded to, this annual event uh, aims to highlight the variety of services and support offered by the university library. Now, we've taken a slightly different approach this year by trying to center the voices of faculty more. I have to confess, back when I was in charge of the organization, it was very sort of one way, librarians telling you what we're doing and how you can take advantage of our services. So this time we're taking a, a different approach, asking faculty to share how they've uh, made use of our services uh, for enhancing their teaching, research, et cetera. And I'm really, really grateful to all of our speakers for their time this morning. Now, for my part, I intend to take as little time as possible for these opening remarks so that we can get to the sharing. But I do ask for your indulgence. Now, my colleagues recognize this because I show it at almost every library meeting. Uh, I once again share this guiding principle. It's kind of animated all of my efforts since taking over as university librarian two years ago. Uh, so this mission, the mission of librarians is to improve society through facilitating knowledge creation in our communities. I find this phrasing so compelling because it serves as a constant reminder to, to me and my colleagues that we as librarians are not just responsible for a collection of books or even a collection of e-resources, uh, nor is the maintenance of the library's physical spaces our only or principal concern. Rather, our mission is to do uh, whatever we can to effectively facilitate knowledge creation in this, the HKBU uh, community. And this work really takes a myriad of different forms, uh, and many of which we'll be talking about today. Uh, so just looking at the rundown, we're going to hear about how librarians have supported teaching and learning through information literacy instruction. We'll further learn how our transformative open access agreements have helped the work of our scholars reach a wider audience. And we'll next discover how we partnered with faculty and students to develop this very space that we now find ourselves in, the Transdisciplinary Discovery Commons. And last but certainly not least, we'll find out about the essential work uh, being done to preserve unique archival materials and uh, to ensure they can be studied you know, for generations to come. And those really, it's even though that rich agenda is just a few examples of the work that librarians are doing every day to support the university's mission. And all of this is made possible by the good communication and understanding of our faculty and staff partners. So my sincere thanks, as always, for your ongoing support. And uh, with that, I just wish you an enjoyable morning and I'll pass it back to Maggie. Thank you, Chris. That was very warm indeed. And um, um, now I'm going to introduce our first speaker and. Lucky my husband is a Romanian, so I've been practicing how to pronounce the name. So Dr. Yulia Gheorghiu, and from the like, I'm good, yeah. Okay, cool. 
Uh, she's the lecturer in the Department of Sociology, and she will be uh, talking with us about uh, library teaching support. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Chris and Wallace, for inviting me to speak and to share. So when Wallace asked me to come here, I didn't really know what exactly it was that I needed to talk about. So I'll be talking about um, my position as a course coordinator for Invitation to Social Sciences, which is a core curriculum course that we offer to a pretty diverse pool of students. And uh, to, I will be talking about how um, the library representatives, namely Mr. Chris Chan and Wallace Wong, have been helping us uh, in teaching that uh, particular course. Um, now, from my discussions with students, as well as from my previous um, tenure as a library coordinator for the sociology department, um, I do know that the library does a lot of work and a lot of workshops, seminars, helping both students and staff with library literacy and also finding all sorts of resources, academic and otherwise, that are meant to help us all go about our daily business of um, teaching, studying, researching, and, and so on. Um, I'll be mainly talking about um, the guest talk that um, Wallace and Chris have been giving in our classes. So I've been involved in teaching this course for three years now, and uh, for the and I'm a part of a large team of instructors. Um, each um, instructor coming from different departments within the Faculty of Social Sciences. Now, for the last two years, we've been. Um, very grateful to have Wallace and Chris give an information literacy uh, talk where they introduce our students to different types of um, sources, academic and otherwise, both media and non-media sources. And they've been helping us to help students understand, engage critically with different types of sources and to um, sort of understand the different levels of authority as well as credibility that each of those sources actually have. And so um, this is obviously very important, as anyone who has been involved in teaching in the last few years knows, since our students have access to so much information, but they're not always necessarily um, very adept at actually selecting the sort of right information, particularly when it comes to writing academic essays. Um, as um, well, there's just too much to choose from. Um, and so um, based on conversations that I've had with other colleagues teaching this class, um, the uh, guest talk has been very effective. And um, this is not a very easy task to accomplish because actually teaching that class is not necessarily very easy. So it's a diverse pool of students. They come from both BBA. So they're year one students who haven't yet selected their majors. They're also senior year entrants who have been in community colleges across Hong Kong and have already joined departments that they're majoring in. So coming up with or tailoring a course that can actually uh, cater to their needs um, is not necessarily very easy. So we rely on both students' engagement in, uh, in the classes where Wallace and Chris have been teaching, uh, their performance in the assessment as we did incorporate the uh, library talk uh, within the assessment, and also their ability to uh, work um, afterwards when we say that it was really a very effective um, resource for our students in learning to engage more with um, all kinds of um, uh, sources, both um, academic and otherwise. Um, now, before I wrap up, I do also want to thank Chris and Wallace for all of their support during the time when I was library coordinator for my department um, because they were always very helpful and supportive in providing answers to the most ridiculous requests um, and um, also for more um, um, important or substantive ones as well. Um, and in always recommending the newest resources that the library had acquired that could have been helpful to either myself or my colleagues in our um, teaching and research um, efforts. Um, and so the last thing that Wallace suggested that I could talk about were some suggestions for what the library could do more of. Now, um, I know that this may be something that okay, some people may be more adept at working with and others less so. Perhaps Dr. Morehouse would be able to speak more to it because I know you're on the university task force on that. Um, um, as ChatGPT and all of its offshoots are actually becoming a permanent presence in, in our classrooms nowadays. 
Um, and um, as academic integrity um, is becoming kind of a gray uh, sort of area because cheating no longer really looks like what we used to think it looks like. And it, we don't necessarily always have the tools to um, detect whether cheating is taking place or not. Right? Turnitin tells us one thing and then other software to detect tell us other thing. Um, perhaps the library could um, help us uh, navigate through this particularly new challenge that, uh, that we all have to face. Right? So I just want to thank you all again for inviting me to speak today. So. Thank you, Dr. Georgiou. And um, no matter how ridiculous your request is, well, we are happy to accommodate. So don't worry, send us your teaching support request. So next we have our um, Mr. Ryan Mann, Associate Dean for Undergraduate Studies from the School of Business to uh, talk to us about how the library resources helped with this uh, Go Be Your Learning program. Hello, thank you everyone. Um, this is Ryan from the School of Business. Nice to meet all of you and thank Chris and Maggie for inviting me to come to share our initiative here. Uh, one thing I'm quite sure that no matter how much, how ridiculous your request is, library can help you. Uh, I think nothing is more ridiculous than we do here. So uh, what we have done is uh, we actually launched a new graduation pro uh, requirement for our students, for our BBA students starting from this year. So this is called the uh, BU uh, Learning Program. So we want them to actually uh, to, uh, uh, to use uh, LinkedIn Learning to actually uh, to incorporate to their uh, graduation requirement here. So what we have done is uh, we actually uh, collaborate with LinkedIn and also HKBU Library. Uh, one thing that we do is now that we have a lot of students. In, in, when we were young, if you're an accounting student, you probably want to be an accountant. If you are to study marketing, you might want to be a marketing uh, professionals. But now these students have very much uh, very direct uh, aspiration, right? Some of them might want to uh, be a social ent uh, enterprise. Some of you might want to uh, be a YouTuber. So that's why the skill set that they need is very different from before. And it's really hard for us to do a one uh, one shot for all for all of them. It's really hard. So that's why what we do is we want them to uh, take their initiative uh, to uh, actually roll on their learning autonomy and try to learn uh, the skill they want that helps their career aspiration. So by using LinkedIn Learning. So what we did is uh, we know that students need a push. Especially active learning is so important, but they never think it's important. So that's why we need to kick them a little bit here. So that's why starting from this year, we actually introduced the uh, BBA graduation requirement. Each student have to uh, at least spend 40 hours in four years, four years. Uh, it's the first 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 step, okay, to try it out to see the response. So um in in that case, if all years they have to spend 40 hours on whatever they want to learn. And we have a launching ceremony in uh in uh the early this year in September to kick off the initiative. We have invited 200 registrar to come here with Chris here sharing with us and also the uh, the person from LinkedIn uh to share how what happened here. So uh why we want to do that here. Uh the reason is actually quite simple. Uh few things. The first thing is some students as uh as our colleagues just mentioned, they have too many choices, right? But uh, you know, when you have so many choices, choice avoidance may be a big problem. So that's why they may not want to do anything. So what we do is uh, we want on LinkedIn Learning. One thing that's good is if the student actually choose uh, their career path, for example, if they want to be a marketing manager uh, using the AI or algorithm, basically, you know that LinkedIn have a big data, right? So they actually know what happened about the job market and they know what are the most essential skills for the marketing manager nowadays. And they're very updated. So that's why the LinkedIn uh, algorithm will actually recognize, uh, rec recommend some courses, for example, Google Analytics. If you want to be a marketing manager, you have to learn that. Uh, for example, you have to do digital marketing trend. So basically, all these things are uh, recommended by AI. And the student actually can uh, look at these courses here and then learn some of these uh, short, um, short courses. Uh, and the certificate will automatically enter their LinkedIn profile. So that's why by the time when they find a job, all these things will become their part of their profile. And it may actually help them to land a job eventually. So, um, so LinkedIn learning over 18,000 uh, plus courses here, covering most of the most in demand business, technology, creative skill. So we just let them choose what they want. And there's in some other side, I think, which is quite important to us. Uh, many students, they actually have no idea about their career. We want to push them earlier. Year one, you start clicking the, the title here. At least you know what it is about and what kind of job that can be there. So they will start planning a little bit earlier. And the second important thing is it almost forced them to create a LinkedIn profile. Uh, which is extremely important. So uh, you know it for networking or even in the long run for university ranking, it might be helpful, okay? Yeah, seriously, eventually they have to look at uh, employ employability, right? So that's why uh, they check the data from LinkedIn for sure, you can emerge. In. So that's why um, so that's why we want to do this as well. So um, this is what we 
try to do and want to achieve here. And but the challenge is so big because the most important thing is money, resources, right? How can we do that? Without the help of library, definitely cannot do that. So once we have this an initiative here, the first thing we do is instead of contacting LinkedIn, probably we know that we have our LinkedIn account here, right? Everyone. So we contact Maggie. Hey Maggie, we all have this idea. Uh, can we solve this for us? We were worrying that because it's so ridiculous. How can you ask library to create 1,000 more accounts or suddenly license for us, right? It's so costly. Maggie say, yeah, great, we'll help you. Wow, so that's why I'm quite sure. No matter how ridiculous it is, they will help us, okay? So, uh, so they help us to acquire an extra license for our student and also uh, guide our administrative staff for the admin pages, use a group or coordination, which is extremely helpful because we need to rely on those analytics to track their progress to see what happened. So I can tell you the result is actually quite interesting. Uh, this is the first year to do it, right? We have 300 some students. Uh, over 60% already registered their account and over 40% already start using learning, LinkedIn learning. And one extreme outlier, actually that person spent 28 hours already in semester one, okay? So basically, uh, it's actually quite quite good to, to us, okay? I think we achieved something. Uh, in fact, our initiative is quite, um, I would say quite innovative or quite successful that even LinkedIn management like it so well. So they hope to help us to write a, a content story, a feature story in the LinkedIn uh, page, okay? Uh, subject to GAO approval, okay? Uh, which is quite hard, everyone knows, right? Maybe Martin need to help <laughs> a little bit here later on, okay? So basically, that's something we are doing here. Yeah, it'll be good because it's the only uh, the only the tenth uh, cases in academic. If we were if we were post there, we will be next to U University of Toronto and Harvard Business School, okay? About that. So that's why we hope our GAO can have a green knife for us, okay, to do that. Anyway, so thanks library again, thanks uh, Chris, thanks Maggie for your uh for your help, okay? Seriously, without that, without them, without help, it cannot be done, okay? So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. So now you know like how crazy librarians can get when it comes to like helping students to learn. All right, and now like we will have our librarians to share with us some uh, library updates on the library resources and teaching support. May we invite uh, Ms. Wing Wu, our head of resource management, and Nancy Chan, head of user and information services. Thanks, Julia and Ryan for the valuable sharing. So, Wing, as here in HKBU, we are just like a solar system. As seen in the slide, actually, faculties and faculty members are orbiting the university for academic excellence. While our strong team of liaison librarians at the back providing wonderful teaching and learning support. So you will see that um, as our faculty members and admin colleagues actually welcome to contact your liaison librarian directly and see how we integrate library resources and training with your courses and teaching activities. Possible tailor-made topics include information skills, subject-specific databases, and endnote and citation management. So if you scan the purple QR code at the bottom right-hand corner, you will find the entire list of library coordinators and liaison librarians, so that you will find Maggie, our MC today, supporting business. May, over there. Communication and creative arts. Also arts for the time being temporary. David, our Chinese medicine librarian, Wallace. Wallace for social sciences. And also we have Joyce and Sylvia full Zoom online supporting SCE and CIE St. Moon campus. Also myself, Nancy, for science and transdisciplinary programs. So feel free to explore more possibilities together with us. 
Okay, so uh, we have all these uh, crazy librarians. <laughs> and for me, I, I'm in charge of the resource management uh, in the library. So we work at the back end and then um, to acquire um, um, the library collections to uh, support your teaching and research as well. So in this solar system, uh, we also put different um, new resources, mostly are new resources um, uh, in this uh, 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 slide. And uh, again, if you slide, uh, if you scan on the QR code on the kind of a top right, the black one, you will see all the um, uh, databases uh, already subscribed by the library. And in here, I mean, uh, we only highlight a few, uh, particularly the uh, new resources we acquired last year. Um, I think there are a couple that I would like to uh, highlight here because uh, they are quite uh, different from the traditional library books and journals resources. Uh, you will see uh, in the middle, uh, at the top, there will be a SDG online. Uh, it's, a, it's not a database, but it's a, um, a um, resources that integrate a lot of uh, books or journals or even um, audiovisual materials. And by theme, they will say a uh, different SDG theme. So when you click in the each theme and you will find the resources on this matter. So this is quite a um, unique resources if you are interested in the SDG uh, topics. And uh, below that, you will see a um, the black one is called Canopy. Canopy is a video streaming uh, uh, resources. And um, we do occasionally receive uh, some uh, recommendation from faculty member that, oh, I mean, instead of like checking out our physical uh, video uh, collection, do you have any online streaming one? So Canopy is the one uh, that we have. And this is one of the few that they can also, I mean, uh, let library to subscribe to it because we do receive some other recommendations, but the vendors say that, oh, no, it's not for uh, a library to subscribe. So Canopy is uh, one of the uh, video uh, streaming uh, resources for you to use. And uh, LinkedIn Learning, um, I think um, it's already here for a few years, but this time uh, to collaborate with the business school, we um, actually expand to have a uh, double of the seats available for our uh, uh, students, particularly the business students to uh, access to create the account. And then uh, we have a uh, condo libraries. Condo libraries is a um, California based uh, uh, vendor. Uh, they provide a lot of uh, fairly uh, leisure magazines in uh, different languages, uh, Japanese, Korean, um, Chinese and uh, English, of course. So this is more um, for uh, a uh, leisure reading online for or for any user who are, uh, want to enjoy some uh, magazine uh, materials. And uh, at the bottom, the red one, Chicago Menu Online. Chicago Menu Online. And um, the first time we subscribe to this online resources for, um, 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 I think, for, for doing citation, that would be very useful. And... Um, I also highlight another one, the one look like uh, the, the Saturn uh, is the um, BKSY. Actually, it's the Shanghai Library uh, uh, database. If you're doing uh, Chinese research in uh, Mingguo or, or, or Republican period, we acquire a, a few uh, new uh, database subset. Uh, mainly it's Chinese uh, uh, newspaper published during the Republican China period uh, for you to use. So um, these are a few. And... Um, on the top right, I mean, it's being hidden. It's called Osmosis from Elsevier. This is a very specialized database uh, for nursing program. As uh, you may remember, a few years ago, uh, HKBU opened up our first uh, nursing program. And um, each year, they have been getting uh, quite a good enrollment. And um, the student would use uh, Osmosis for their uh, uh, clinical um, um, uh, studies. And uh, Sage Research Method is another one that uh, is a very um, uh, multidiscipline, uh, not only just book chapter or whatever, they also have data set, also video inside too. So um, this would be uh, very good for, I think, not only the um, uh, um, teaching, but also research. So uh, these are some of the highlights for the uh, resources. Um, and uh, I, I mean, like, if you have any recommendation, feel free to contact your liaison librarian and let us know. But of course, I mean, this will also be, I mean, we need to struggle with our library materials budget. <laughs> so I know, Chris, I mean, we have been talking about the library budget all the time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Wing and Nancy.
And now we will move on to a new topic, scholarly communications. And our first speaker for this section is uh, Dr. Benjamin Luke Morehouse, Assistant Professor in the Department of Education Studies, and he will share with us about open access publishing. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Chris, for inviting me to talk today. Uh, I'm going to use my Scopus profile uh, as my main slide uh, because I'm an academic and I need to self-promote primarily. Uh, but, but also, uh, uh, it kind of presents to you the benefit of open access. Uh, so uh, the reason I wanted to show it to you is because I think I'm also, I'm almost at 1,000. I was hoping it would be at 1,000 today, but almost there. Uh, basically, uh, if I go to my cited by highest and I look at my top 10 cited papers, all of them are either open access or at some time they were free access. So that means my case, myself, have hugely benefited from the concept of open access. And I try to think about why that might be. And I think there's a number of reasons we probably know why, right? More people can access it. More people who don't have wonderful databases like we have can access them in different countries in different contexts. Two, generally people are lazy. So if there's an article that they can click on and download straight away, they're likely to choose that one over the article that requires downloading or going through the library system to get to. I think three, uh, AI will pick up these articles more commonly now. Uh, there's been a lot of debate about how uh, different AI tools build their databases. Uh, there's a big assumption that they can access open access materials much more accessibly than closed uh, access materials. And uh, a lot of the tools that we use now, like Semantic Scholar, Site, Consensus, they have access to these kinds of articles when kind of traditional subscription articles are kind of still behind those paywalls, so they can't access those. So if our students or our colleagues are using those tools to search for academic literature or try and answer a question, there's a good chance that these open access articles will come up first. Okay, so I think these are the kind of key reasons we might see this kind of trend in my publication record. And as we go down to the bottom, we start to see the more closed access ones uh, there as well. Okay, uh, so I think that's reasons. Uh, for me, uh, there's another benefit, I think, for open access that's huge. Uh, I'm an educational researcher, and one of my target audience for my articles is actually frontline practitioners. Uh, some of them don't work for universities. Many of them don't. You know, they work for uh, colleges, they work for <coughs> schools, uh, they work for the government uh, and other other organizations that don't have access to the kind of research that we do, the publications that we make. So open access also allows them to access this kind of uh, research as well. So we can kind of see them as an audience for our research. Uh, so I was really happy uh, when I first came to uh, Hong Kong BU uh, uh, three years ago, uh, and I mentioned this to Chris, I was kind of uh, a little bit frustrated one with the kind of accessibility of materials at BU. I came from Hong Kong U and you know, they got huge, libraries got huge budgets, I think. So they subscribe to everything, anything. Uh, and then I came here and I realized lots of the journals that I published and I couldn't even access. Uh, and then that changed. Uh, we started to see much more accessibility to the journals that I publish in, which was wonderful. And at the same time, uh, this big push towards uh, transformative agreements. So we can now publish a lot of our research and open access uh, format. And it's incredibly easy. I did two this summer, one with Taylor and Francis and one with Wyler, Wiley. And uh, all you do once the public, once the publication has been accepted, uh, it asks you what institution you work for. It says we have an agreement with them. You click on it. Uh, I think an email goes to the library here. Someone, someone approves it here. Uh, and then, uh, then it just appears on their website as open access. So incredibly useful, incredibly easy. Uh, saves us having to pay ahead, which, which is what we used to have to do, uh, which can be a little bit scary that you may not get the money back. Uh, so, so this way you feel safe that uh, that you're not going to have to pay anything. Uh, so really grateful for the library for making this available. Uh, I'm now making choices about where I publish based on the agreements that we have, because I know that I'm likely to get <laughs> greater uh, impact through citation, impact through readership, through my open access publications. So, uh, those of you who are thinking about it, it's really worth uh, checking uh, which publications they are. Currently, I think it's Springer, Wiley, Taylor and Francis. 
more to come. Watch this space or watch Chris's space or the library space and you'll see. So that's what I wanted to share. And thank you for the library for, for allowing more people to read our research. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morehouse. And absolutely, I'm like the lazier person. It's really annoying to have to log in all the time, you know, to library resources. And uh, sometimes I just like, ah, oh, never forget it. So please do like, publish your articles, open access, or if you have any question to uh, ask the library. And now speaking of open access and our scholarly communication supports, uh, we will invite Ms. Rebecca Wong, our head of uh, digital initiatives and research in the library to give us some updates. First of all, thank you, Dr. Morehouse, for your very convincing case. I hope after listening to his speech, you all agree that OA is a very important step for you to take to enhance the visibility of your research. So I'm Rebecca. I'm res responsible for the research support services of the library. Because the uh, OA is very important. So actually, the library has three ways to make your articles open access. The first is that uh, whenever you input, you record a research output into iRIMS, the library would check the OA policies uh, from the publisher's website or sometimes even email the publishers for charity. So we can make all articles published under a CC license can be made OA through our iRIMS. So this is the first step. The second step is that I think you, most of you have already received uh, uh, several rounds of email that sent from the library asking you to send us to your author a set of manuscripts. You have, if you have received those emails and if you have responded to us, your manuscript are already made available uh, through iWIMS for public access. The third part is that uh, is uh, what the service that uh, Dr. Moros uh, just mentioned. This is the transformative agreements. The library has signed uh, transformative agreements with several publishers. And so far there are 155 articles by OA through this TA provision. So uh, in 2023, there are eight publishers uh, signing uh, TA with us. Uh, it, the names are here. And there are three more publishers to come in 2024. Uh, that is Springer, ACM Open, and also IOP. So out of these 155 articles, the departments that got the most advantage of the TA provision come from the Faculty of Science, followed by Faculty of Arts, and then School of Communication. So as Dr. Mor Morehouse just mentioned, the process is very easy. It's uh, almost transparent to you. So you just have to accept uh, or agree that your article to make OA. So uh, several weeks ago, we decided to take up a study, although not very scientific, but we hope that to learn whether uh, there is a real impact of you know, making your articles OA. So we look back to our TA log, and then we select 18 articles uh, that are made OA through our TA. And then we also try to find another article written by the same authors, published in the same journals, but it's close to access. So here comes 18 pairs of articles. And then we use Scopus to find the citation counts. As you can see that the orange bars are the OA articles, the black bars are the non-OA articles. You can see that OA articles have much more citations than the non-OA ones. So other than uh, making your research output uh, open access, we also have another service that is digital scholarship services who will help you to make your original research data or original research materials uh, openly accessible. So uh, we have a DSG grant for you to apply. Although the deadline has just passed, you know, it's the end of November, but if you still wanted to try or want to learn more, you can contact uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Eric Chow at the end of the hall. <laughs> So uh, in the last minute, I just want to show you several screen caps that to demonstrate what we can do through this service. Uh, this is a project that contains lots of network graph. Uh, it's a collaboration with a communication professor. Uh, we also develop a number of corpuses. This one is uh, co-developed with a translation professor. Of course, digitization is one of our main theme too. Uh, we do scanning, OCR, indexing. Uh, this is with a film professor. Uh, nowadays, we develop more and more GIS application. This is uh, the one that developed with a history professor. So uh, if you want to learn more about OA, please contact me after the event. If you want to learn more about the digital scholarship uh, services, please contact Eric. Thank you.
Thank you, Rebecca. And do check out a lot of digital projects. Uh, they are really beautiful and really useful as well. And next, we will move on to, uh, to our library exhibition and col uh, collection discovery section. And we will have Dr. Glasho, director uh, in the Division of Transdisciplinary Undergraduate Programs, to talk to us about the program and also this space, TDDC. All right, so good morning. How many of you have heard about transdisciplinary programs? Can you have to show a hand? Good, great. How many of you are aware of our division of transdisciplinary undergraduate programs? Very nice. Do you know where our office is? No, we just moved in. Yeah, you know, very good. <laughs> we just moved in. Um, that's actually in Sinhan campus in RRS 902. So please drop by. We just moved in um, at the beginning of this year. All right. Um, so my name is Glass, and I'm with this, uh, in short, we call it DTUP because trans the vision of transdisciplinary undergraduate programs is actually quite long. All right. So remember us, um, DTUP, and that's where we are belonging to. So first of all, I'd like to thank very much to Chris um, and Nancy for inviting me to talk about how library has been supporting the transdisciplinary programs. But before that, I actually want to say my relationship with the library started back in um, eight years ago in 2015, where I was still teaching in Shatwin campus. I was teaching a course called marketing, a qualitative marketing research. And I contacted the library that was eight years ago where digitalizations were um, probably not beyond my thoughts. So I contacted the library and said, um, I would like my students to do content analysis on historical um, documents. So the library made photocopies with all this, where it actually um, stayed with me for a couple of years where I keep using it um, for my students to locate historical archive to identify key visuals um, for um, producing some advertising campaign. So those, those were the days. But um, forward, <laughs> okay, fast forward eight years, um, I feel, of course, I'm more, there's actually more with the launching of the four transdisciplinary programs. The library has been support not just on class activities, but in fact, I'm more grateful um, for the resources, teaching and learning resources that have been supporting us, as well as the physical space here that we are all in right here. Um, as well as other support in class activities. So I would like to keep it very short, but these are the areas I would like to cover for today. Now, first of all, no matter you are teach, you are um, part of the transdisciplinary programs or you are actually teaching courses related to transdisciplinary, please feel free to reach out to Chris and Nancy because they are creating a particular collection that focuses on transdisciplinary knowledge, but at the same time cultivating a transdisciplinary mindset. I think that's actually very important for our students um, to equip them, for, to prepare them for the future. So not only on physical books, but also on e-collections as well. So the, so the team has been working very hard and liaise with our faculty members who are actually involved in teaching these courses to build up the collection. So as you can see, when we cultivate child transdisciplinary mindset, we also want them to help the society to address um, social issues, environmental issues. So SDG is also one of our focus. And in that regard, they have also came up um, with, I mean, they have subscribed to these SDG online. And I have to encourage everyone, if you are interested in SDG, this is indeed a very, very useful resources, both, to the te both for the teachers as well as for the students. And we have experienced it for over the past uh, two years, where we encourage our students to log in. Um, things are very updated. It's very relevant as well and easy to understand. So, and then we um, we also feel like these are the confined area, confined like um, hub for students to discover new knowledge related to this SDG as well. And of course, we also encourage our students to come to this place. Because if you think that we do not know how to tell students about these resources, please feel free to email Chris and Nancy because they will help you to do the job to tell students about these resources. This is exactly what they have done for a library workshop to introduce. So you can either invite your students to come to this place here, all right, to discover things together, or you can invite them to go to your class. But I, of course, suggest them to invite to this place because when I was back in school, I always thought library is supposed to be very quiet. And now when I speak right now, they feel a little bit uh, very different. 
they're very different. So I also want our students to view different, the different side of library as well. All right, so, and then with these plates here, which you can see, this is what they call the Transdisciplinary Discovery Common, TDDC. Um, it's a place for discovery and exploring. When we when we are not here today, where well, this uh, professional setup, they're supposed to be bean bags. There are the lights will be dimming lights. They are showcasing of artwork. They are showcasing of different work. So if you ever think about, do you want a place to showcase your showcase your student work, either a digital work or a physical work? Do you think about this place? Because this place is actually not just for this transdisciplinary students. It's actually open for the whole university. All right. Um, so we also were very fortunate because the Chris and Nancy allow this space um, as a place for our students to experience, to actually apply what they have learned as well. So one of the transdisciplinary programs, Arts and Technology, our students completed a two month summer internship here. So all the work that they've done here, uh, partially, were as the outcome of the students because they were they followed ideas to outfit the international um, interactive kiosks discovery relocations and also the creations um, of books as well so it also provide our students to also contribute so i think it's a two ways engagement okay sorry and of course, when we have all these students' work, we don't want to just limit to university, um, Hong Kong BU community. So whenever we have overseas visit, and this week we're actually receiving uh, professors and students from Western Sydney University, we also invite them to come over to this place um, to actually explore. So it's not just limit to our community as well. So thanks, Nancy, for that. Okay, so what I've just talked about is resources, teaching resources, one-way provision, or you can ask librarians to come to your class, it becomes two-way. And then you can also invite your students to come here, that's more engaging. But what I thought it's even, we could do even more in the three-way communication or three-way engagement is that the library support in one of the courses that we teach called Global Challenges. So allow me to do a bit of marketing here. Global Challenges is a course that is for all the transdisciplinary students. So up to now, we have 260 students right now in two cohorts. So one cohort is about 140. 120 and 140. And then we all come together to do a one year long courses that focus on the SDG as well. So in this year, we folk, we do um, sustainable clothing, eating, commuting, uh, living and commuting. In Chinese, we call it All right. So what the library has been supporting us is that, first of all, when we talk sustainable cities, we want the students to understand what the library can do for them. All right, but it's hard for faculty members to tell them, you know, they can, you can use. We can, of, of course, list out all the resources on the course outline and let the students to choose, you know, what they want to do. But we want to do more than that. So we took advantage of the Easter um, last, uh, this year, this year. And then we called it, because this is a TDDC, we wanted it to be a discovery. So we came up with a little game of like a discovery hub. I did when in my course is 140 students. So we divide them into two tutorials. Actually, we are having 70 students in one tutorial. That's a big class. So what we do is we invite them by group in groups to come over to the library where the other students were still in the classroom. And then the librarians came up with the Easter egg with these cities, um, the lucky draw. And what they have to do is that they will have to scan a map here. So they will have to locate resources, either e-resources or physical resources, and they have to scan the app to, and then to drop the pin of, and identify that place, what are the best practice in sustainable cities. So and then it's a synchronized um, thing at the same time. I know it's kind of low tech as compared to AI, but, uh, <laughs> but it works, okay? Um, and then back in the, in the classroom, at the, at the same time, the students are seeing all the work. And so it's like a racing game. So whatever showcase the best uh, Brax practice, we get a small gift as well, given by the library as well. So that was one of the things that we did. And when we talk about sustainable clothing, um, <coughs> we at that mo at that time where university were just introducing um, ChatGPT, okay, official use of ChatGPT. So we thought we contact Chris and say, would you like to come to my class um, to talk about um, the overall library resources, but particularly on how students could use ChatGPT. As one of the, some of the faculty members here, we've just said, these 
informations are just too open, too many choices. We don't know how to select and we don't know what to do with it. I personally don't know how to do with it as well. But Chris is amazing who came up with this section plan provided by the library. I actually learning from him. So it, it gives you a very um, detailed um, uh, plan of what he's going to cover. And at the same time, we also work together. All right. We after Chris introduced the Chat GPT and about how to give prompts to to Chat GPT, we also require our students to write a reflection paper. So instead of limiting them how to do it, we actually encourage them, and we have professions here to tell them how to use it, and then they we gave them assignment, um, for for it. So we're actually very grateful for that experience. All right. Um. Library has been really supporting us a lot, <laughs> okay? And I'm lots of actually looking forward to more collaborations. I was talking up to Chris. In this area here, we were actually thinking about doing a fashion show. And then I still think this idea is still with us and we will make it happen. So before you leave this space today, please look around and get some inspiration and see what other things that you can make use of this space here. So we inspire this place to be not just for transdisciplinary, but we want all the students to use the space and eventually it will provide a transdisciplinary platform for all the Hong Kong BU community. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hall. Absolutely very interesting uh, projects and programs there. So do follow their, um, I think, IG and follow the library IG as well. Might as well be on Instagram. So next we will have uh, Ms. Lolita Kwok to share with us some library updates on library exhibition and collection discovery. And she is the head of resource discovery in the library. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, the major duty of uh, resource discovery is uh, overseeing the one search platform. That's where you uh, search for um, collection. But today I'm, I want to focus on two things. So the first one is um, <coughs> library exhibitions. So we have a very good uh, library exhibition space. When you come into the library, you cannot miss it. And uh, there are services that uh, you can think of. So we, if you have a research project and we can turn it into a visual uh, content. So it's a, an exhibition. And uh, let's see a case. So this is um, a research project done by Professor Clara Ho uh, from History Department. And it's a study about elderly in Qing Dynasty. I think the original research should be very um, difficult to understand, but we can um, visualize it uh, into more uh, easily understand concepts. So. Um, so this is one way to um, disseminate your research findings. And um, the second thing you can think of uh, to collaborate with us uh, in terms of exhibitions, you can showcase your class assignments or your uh, students' works. So for example, um, this is the jewelry design from SEE. So uh, before that, uh, people are not aware we have jewelry design uh, course uh, by SEE. But because we have regular exhibitions, and uh, one of this is a recurring exhibition, and people are, are more aware of the programs, new programs are uh, offered by the university. And the next thing I want to uh, introduce is uh, we put our unique collections on JSTOR platform. So when you search, um, you, when you're doing your research on JSTOR, you're not only finding the articles, you might come across our collections. So um, as of today, we have eight collections uh, uploading, uploaded to JSTOR. So they are our unique collections. So they're not, um, I think you, you cannot find it elsewhere. And um, also uh, we want to collaborate with you, your faculty or your um, departments may have uh, publications. So um, this is a use case with our School of Communications. So they send us their publications. They, it can be any reports, bulletin, or their faculties, our research output. And we will collect it for historical archives, and we will digitize scanning. So uh, you, you, you don't think of scanning, just scanning. But we will put um, special care about personal policy. For example, privacy, we will, we will, not, we will be aware of uh, what can be publicly accessible and what's not. And also we will catalog them and you can find it on the library platform. So for example, uh, 
School of Communication has a special sub-collection under the university publication. And these are the publications we digitize uh, for them. And uh, it is scanned, and so you can uh, uh, read the, the full text under the viewer, and people can download it as well. So uh, please consider um, collaborating with us, and uh, we can help you to make your collections more discoverable. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lolita. And I'm very sad because we're coming to our last topic today. Um, uh, this session is about special collection archives. Our speaker uh, for this section is Dr. George Mack, Associate uh, Professor in the Department of Religions and Philosophy. And he will talk about his experience using the library special collections archives. Thank you very much. Um, first, of all, uh, first of all, thank Wen Yu for inviting me to share my experience. Um, I'm a low-tech person, so my presentation might be less exciting than the previous ones. But uh, what I hope is to, uh, through my story, to show that uh, our library is an important partner in research and teaching. And myself is a historian of Chinese Bible translation. So for me, uh, particular, AHC is such an important partner. So my story as a user of AHC began uh, in 2006 when I was still a uh, postgraduate student. At that time, um, I was an MPhil student at the Department of Translation. Um, so um, I remember throughout my studying at CHK as an MPhil student, I visited the AHC from time to time. Uh, why? Because at that time, I work on the history of the Bible Society in China, particularly on how it patronized the translation project of the famous uh, Bible version, the Mandarin Julian version. So, uh, of course, I find a lot of useful materials, but one of the things I remembered most uh, is something I listed in my bibliography. So uh, this uh, is the revised version of my MPhil dissertation. The library has two copies. One of them is in AHC, okay? Um, so why I mentioned this, um, actually this piece of work uh, is a memoir of Alexander Wiley, so a very famous sinologist in 19th century, uh, written by a French sinologist, Henri Cordier. So it's important because I did not know much about the man, Alexander Wiley, who was the first permanent agent of the Bible Society in China. And because of this, uh, even though it was available only in Michael Freem, I still was able to extract information from the memoir, providing important contextual information for my dissertation. So um, the story um, goes, I completed my dissertation in 2007, and I be, uh, continue my studying. Okay. Oh. Okay, um, so I continued my studying. I did my doctorate in Cambridge uh, between 2007 and 2011. And this time I work on an interesting topic. So I want to know how Bible translation contribute to Mandarin, uh, the development of this language from simply a lingua franca in Imperial China uh, into the national language of China. Uh, in my during my doctoral studies, I came back home from time to time. And whenever I was in Hong Kong, the HC was the place I must visit. Why, as I wrote in my introductory chapter, so this was the revised version of my doctoral thesis published in 2017. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a physical copy in the library collection because I only have a digital uh, uh, copy. But anyway, uh, I highlight the importance of the HC in my book because it contains a vast collection of microfilm materials. Uh, for my research, uh, particularly the bulletins and periodicals published by Chinese Protestant churches and also organizations in both Chinese and English. So why they were important? Because in my thesis, I want to argue the church did a lot in mass education and literacy uh, movements and how they did it. So they very often they would use biblical text in Mandarin to teach the illiterate 
how to read and write in Mandarin. So to promote Mandarin as the new standard language of the country. So um, thanks to, I mean, the HC, I got my PhD. And then I joined HKBU in 2011. I spent six years at the David C. Lam Institute for East-West Studies, uh, a member of its research staff. So I continue benefiting uh, from the collection of the HC. And, but I want to tell something about my recent research. Um, so I got a GRF grant recently, and I'm going to work on the history of Hong Kong as the World Center for Chinese Protestant Bible Publishing and Distribution. So you might be surprised, actually within these 15 years, Hong Kong was simply the center for the Chinese Bible ministry. In other words, if you want to get a copy of the Chinese Bible, 99%, uh, you have to contact the Hong Kong Bible House to buy a copy. So why I want to use this example, uh, because recently I found an interesting material. Um, so in at the HC, we have a lot of uh, microfilm of old periodicals. And one of them is called the China Bookman. Uh, it was a quarterly published by Christian Publishers Association in China. Uh, it ran from 1918 to 1951. So it happened that uh, one day I uh, used the microfilm reader and read the microfilm, and I found an advertisement of the China Bible House, so the Bible Society in China. And I find that this advertisement shows the address of its Hong Kong office. So from this advertisement, I realized, oh, okay, <clears throat> if I were a Christian, in Hong Kong in 1950, where could I get a Chinese Bible? So I have to go to uh, the first Ice House Street. So where you said is the site where the Mandarin Oriental Hotel is located. Because in the past, it was the site of the building called Queen's Building, where the office was located. So you have a lot of interesting stuff from the HC. And finally, I want to highlight the value of the HC for uh, my teaching because uh, I became a faculty member of the Department of Religion and Philosophy in 2017. And since then, I work with um, Irene and also Wen Yu um, to organize workshops for my students in a number of courses such as uh, Religion and Modern Chinese Societies, and more recently, uh, on my own expertise are uh, Chinese Bible translation. So last academic year, I offered a selected topic course called the History of Chinese Protestant Bible Translation. And before the beginning of the semester, I contact Wen Yu and I work with my teaching assistant and spot a number of Chinese Bibles uh, within the collection and ask Wen Yu to pick some of them. So you can see this is a picture showing the students, my students visiting the HC, and <clears throat> they are having a look of the Bibles owned by the HC. And I particularly highlight this one. You can see an arrow pointing to a large Bible <clears throat> next to Wan Yu. Actually, it's a New Testament. And I would say that this is uh, one of the most valuable books owned by the HC. So it's a copy of the so-called Imperial Edition of the delegates version, which was published in 1894. So why is called Imperial Edition? Because it's one of the copies of the edition prepared for celebrating the 60th and uh, birthday of Empress Dowager TC in Lei Qing. So um, as I remember, it's actually donated by one of the former colleagues of the library. Yeah, so uh, if you did not join my workshop, no problem, it's digitized you can visit the online collection of HC. And I also want my students to know that how hard I was when I was a student. So I asked, so Alice of the HC, so she was demonstrating how to use a microfilm reader. So students were fascinated by these uh, gadgets. And finally, I conclude by showing you that, so this uh, boy, so it was his first time to use this machine. He was very happy and he made a copy of a page of the Chinese Bible as his souvenir. So that's the end of my story. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Mac. So do uh, try to visit like the special collection and archive is just uh, on level four. So go to uh, two floors up, then you will see the section over there. Feel free to reach out to Wen Yu, which is our final speaker today to talk about the collections a little bit more. And Wen Yu is our special collection and archives librarian. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, before I start, oops, that one. Before I start, I would like to pass, take the opportunity to pass um, pamphlets introducing special collections and archives to our visitors here. Firstly, thank you, George, for the free advertisement of AHC collection. Um, it is indeed the uh, flagship collection in our section. Uh, we take a lot of pride in looking after it, and uh, we continue buying materials and develop the collection, so it serves uh, teaching staff and research staff better. Um, we also uh, undertake a lot of digitization, as uh, Lolita showed us um, before, uh, apart from uh, Christianity publications in the AHC collection and university publications. Um, we, we've also digitized other publications by Hong Kong church and religious organizations. Um, they, are, they can be all found on the library's website um, if you go to a tab called Collection Discovery. Um, apart from that, uh, we the special collections and archives also look after some personal papers and organizational records. Um, a lot of them came from uh, also Christianity um, organizations or um, uh, famous people like pastors and reverends. Um, so it supports uh, the uh, AHC collection. Um, but apart from that, we also have other personal papers like uh, from Dr. LC2, um, LC2 was a very act, was very active um, social uh, uh, social activist, I guess, and a politician uh, back in and her impact was in 1960s to 1980s in Hong Kong when she um, was very heavily involved with um, voicing the concerns of the um, lower classes so-called lower classes, and fighting for their interests, um, getting things done better uh, by the government. Um, our collections are all on our web page, um, but I know there are faculty members and uh, people from administrative offices today in the audience, in the audience and on Zoom. Um, and so I guess the one thing that's common to everyone uh, would be the university archives. Uh, apart from university publications, we also collect other things um, like student publications. If you are from the Student Affairs Office, um, these are very important publications for us to collect. Um, and we also have like event flyers or um, award-related um, publications. Um, we have concert. Uh, programs and things like that as well. The archives have a quite a long history, and so in our collection we have quite old publications sometimes. Uh, like this one is a, um, it's a magazine I think from the uh, business management department back in 1974. And so we have very interesting and varied organizations, uh, publications, and other information um, in the university archives. If you are ever interested in finding out the history of the university or the Baptist College before that, um, or if you come across uh, university information or from your faculty department or student societies, um, please let us know and we'll be very happy to talk to you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Wen Yu. And um, now is the Q&A time. And we already have a question from Zoom. So let's first take a look at that one. So we have only one question. So asking about open access support for monograph, not just journal articles. Um, maybe these questions, Chris? Yeah. 
Well, it could be for you too, Rebecca. It's, it's, I interpret it more as a as a budget question. <laughs> we we had we did have. Thank you for the question, by the way, uh, Zoom viewer. It's a good one. Um, as you will have noticed, all of our transformative agreements have been very focused on journal publications up until this point. We had a sort of brief conversation with Taylor and Francis about, you know, how would monographs work? And they do offer something, but the pricing was kind of, it made my eyes water a little bit <laughs> in terms of pay what, what they were expecting. And for that particular case, I remember there was there was all sorts of concerns because it was an edited book uh, with um, contributors from lots of different institutions. And so it didn't really make sense for us because the editor was from HKBU, but for us to pay for the whole thing, you know, and it's, well, I'm getting too much into the details. Uh, we certainly keep it in mind and we'll definitely keep exploring with the publishers whether they can, or together we can come up with a viable model, but at the moment, it just doesn't seem to be feasible at the moment. But there, there are many, I think, like uh, as before, the university presses will come up with something that works, I think, uh, because MIT Press and there's various JSTOR initiatives where they're working on, a, on proper open access for books. Uh, I don't think it will be the sort of transformative agreement style that we're doing, but it's a case of watch the space again, I think. But thank you for the question. Thank you, Chris. And um, is there any questions from the floor? Or you can just share, you know, any comments and anything you have, how much you love the library. Uh -huh. Hi. Uh, so thank you very much. It was so uh, rich and uh, inspiring. And I just wanted to say, I saw an article I think a letter to the editor in the South China Morning Post very recently, uh, a reader was talking about the um, underuse of the public libraries these days and, and the, you know, the dilemma and agonizing <laughs> because of that. And I really hope that Baptist Yu would talk with the Hong Kong public libraries and share ideas because, you know, it's, it's, it's such a shame to have uh, you know, lots of people who would love to do so many kinds of things besides just borrowing books. And yeah, so that's the thought that came to my mind. <laughs> Thank you for your sharing. And um, anything to add to that or any more questions from the floor? I think everyone is waiting to get some coffee and try out the our kiosk and short story dispenser so but before that uh we have some photo taking uh so uh, may i increase chris to present a gift to all our guest speakers so we will do it from the order of the presentation so first um dr yulia Georgiou. and now uh we'll have a closing remarks by chris Thank you so much, May. I'll keep it quick because I know people are dying to get to the coffee and all the other goodies we have laid out. Uh, first of all, big, big thanks, of course, again, to all of our speakers this morning. Uh, super appreciate, so useful, I think. So thank you, big round of applause again. So useful, I hope it's inspired other colleagues to, to also come and ask for whatever support you think the library uh, can provide to you. Um, I had pretty high expectations for this event and I think they were exceeded. So I really do want to particularly thank Nancy, uh, thank, think Nancy, I do think Nancy, thank Nancy, uh, our head of user and information services and her team for their exceptional uh, efforts in organizing this year's uh, event. Uh, Nancy's been with us almost exactly one year, right? I keep thinking she's been here for a decade because, uh, but she's only been here uh, for a year and it was her idea uh, to get more faculty voices. And I think you'll agree with me, it's, it's, it's worked out uh, brilliantly. Uh, thanks also to Maggie, our excellent MC. I know from experience, uh, being an MC is a tough job. I couldn't have done it better myself. So round of applause for, for Maggie. And finally, thank uh, a big round of applause for you guys. You know, so thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for participating, whether in person or on Zoom as well. Uh, I know that colleagues have many, many demands upon their time. So thank you for spending some of it with us this morning. And with that, I'll end it there and I'll see you next year. <laughs>